What is up, town? And sideways, all of you beautiful people. Welcome back to League Unlocked for a little bit of weekend recap action. Playoffs in the LEC, marquee matchups in the LPL, and a bizarro type of super week in the LCS, which is where we begin the action today because <sighs> one bad draft. Two weeks ago now, we talk about with Cloud9, where we have a vein mid, and we say, it's okay, they're just getting a little cocky, having a bit too much fun on the rift, but it's fine, this should still be best team in NA, no problem. Fast forward to the Super Week, and we're falling off the rails fully for this hype train, because it was the Nightmare 0 and 3 for C9 on the Rift, and that's including a couple of matchups against what should be and what kind of still are bottom tier squads in the LCS, or at least, you know, bottom three type squads. And now it's, I mean, you're seeing legit issues across the board. I mean, first and foremost, the biggest two you can talk about is they look lost as a team communication wise in terms of they're almost already expecting to just have a nice hands diff against anyone in the LCS waiting for these other teams to make mistakes. But squads like Immortal, squads like, you know, Shopify Rebellion and some of these other matchups, what should be middle to bottom tier teams, they're not as bad as you think. You can't just roll over and wait for them to screw up for you to be able to pounce and all of a sudden, that ends up being an 0-3 for you. Team Liquid's even picking marquee Ziggs mid pickups uh, for APA and getting kills, but just mechanically, even outside of looking a bit lost in terms of playing side lanes, prioritizing objectives, guys like Berserker and JoJo, who should be best in their role in the league and were just a single split ago. You got Altis. Uh, out of JoJo on Oriana, mistiming on Zonya. You got Berserker and Vulcan getting straight up smashed in 2v2 matchups. No junglers even showing up. And then, uh, I mean, Berserker on these lane dominant picks like Illusion. He's playing the Varus and he is just a shell of his MVP self. Fudge continues to not be a standout top laner. So <clears throat> it's still very early. In the split, and obviously, uh, when playoffs roll around is really the only time you're actually legitimately going to be concerned is when this team is eliminated. But four games in a row now, this super team has dropped, which is, by the way, the longest losing streak in the LCS now. And so many, I just, this team, why are they this bad? Why did they look this bad? They look completely out of sorts. I thought communication was going to be the strong point here. Guys like Vulcan and Blabber are some of the most, and JoJo even mid, these are some of the most vocal players in their respective roles. So lots to sort out for Cloud9. And hey, listen, one of those losses, one of those 2v2 smackdowns Berserker was getting, uh, and Berserker and Vulcan, was against FlyQuest. The young guns, Masu and Busio, were popping off, and FlyQuest completely destroyed Cloud9 in that matchup, and the wonderful entropy that is in the world, when you have a rough 0-3 from Cloud9, you have a wonderful 3-0 from FlyQuest, obviously highlighted by that win uh, against Cloud9, but how about the resurgence of Jensen, now with the star-studded squad around him, Great weekend out of him. We got to see Inspired playing some carry champions as this brand jungle continues to take over. We got Rod of Ages, Bwipo, extra wide on the Gragas. Uh, and even, you know, FlyQuest, they've had that one bad game uh, against NRG where they got completely smashed. But outside of that, there have been six dominant performances out of them. I know this matchup against Dig was even for about 20 minutes before... Jensen starts Goomba stomping on the Orianna. I think he finished with nine kills in that game. We're getting vintage levels of performance out of him. So at least we're getting a bit of that chaotic balance where FlyQuest ascend up as Cloud9 is falling into the depths of the bottom of that uh, LCS, which, I mean, I 
four losses. I wasn't expecting them to reach that until they were deep into the playoffs. I know so many of us were ready to check off another LCS trophy for what is now the biggest org in the LCS. And because there's so much hype, I think people are even more excited to kind of poo-poo and just poop on this Cloud9 roster uh, when they're not performing well. Still plenty of time for them to be bouncing back and... Again, doesn't really matter if they slump into playoffs. This is a team that should be able to turn it on, but very bizarre signs to see them playing at this level right now. And part of that is because a squad like Immortals, which was one of the losses Cloud9 had to this week, but they weren't the only victim because NRG also fall into IMT this weekend and NRG themselves, not a great week, dropping a couple of games to Shopify and to Immortals teams they should be beaten. But IMT unironically might be good that's i know they shouldn't have beaten cloud nine or nrg but they earned those wins they were playing at a damn high level tactical is actually looking bizarrely like a premier 80 carry the duo imports of mask and castle castle in particular basically every game so far this split has been a legit win con for this imt squad and the biggest surprise is they look leaps and bounds ahead of a squad like Cloud9 in terms of how to have how to play the game in general game sense and knowledge. So Immortals absolutely shattering expectations. They got the same record as Cloud9 now at three and four, which is, you know, again, not pretty for Cloud9 and better than expected for IMT, but as, as weak as maybe a lot of these matchups have been so far in the LCS, I gotta tell you, the bottom three, the bottom half of the standings, much better than we're accustomed to seeing, honestly, out of typical LCS squads. And maybe the overall power level of the region is higher when you condense it. It's just that ceiling is uh, a little bit lower, uh, maybe than we've seen in years past. But Whew, so far, IMT, the big surprise, and that combined with uh, Cloud9 and NRG both drop in means FlyQuest sitting pretty, looking good after this uh, super week of action across the LCS. Obviously, we'll dive much deeper into a lot of these other matchups when we do the domestic power rankings for the week. Got to get to the LEC playoffs, though. Round one action. It is best of threes. You have the luxury of being pushed into that loser's bracket. Some uh, very interesting uh, matchups. Let's start with what was the most entertaining series of the weekend. I, all two zeros across the board. Varying levels of competitive, competitiveness in those two zeros. Uh, Fnatic versus Mad Lions. We had some real fun picks uh, in this series, obviously the Zac Top is now starting to take over the meta, but how about downright Darius as a counter for Oscar Rinnan? Easy counter number one because you can use his E, the Afrohead mid air, to yoink Zac out of his uh, jump in, and also his Q is just primo for executing those little bloblets on his passive. Oscar Rinnan had a great name, a uh, great game, excuse me. Jeune and Noah were the big ones who had a massive level up in this series for Fnatic. Game one was pretty convincing. Fnatic was in control for the majority of it, so felt good about them there. It was kind of desperation plays uh, out of Mad Lion's Koi a lot of the time. Even a Blitzcrank with some miracle hooks wasn't enough to get them, nor was El Yoya playing his patented uh, Belveth in the jungle enough to get them in. But game two is the real banger in this series. A couple of Double poke comps, this Ezreal mid that we've been seeing. Jace top for Mirwin was the real issue that Fnatic had to deal with opposite that Corky and Varus. Uh, and then the Yone again, a pair of carry games out of Oscar in. And the Yone was a lot more missed than hit, especially when it came to ulties. But this 3v3, two separate fights. He had a 2v2 in the base trying to close out this game for Fnatic and a 3v3 around the Elder, but it's some clean play out of Noah. Fnatic wins the 3v3. Frescawi eventually ends up TPing in to try and save the game. Mirwin can't get the kill because there's an Elder buff for Fnatic, but absolute chaos and insanity the last 49 minutes. The best highlight of the game for that Ezreal mid is a double kill shutdown at the end on that ulti, but guess what? doesn't matter at all because the game's already over at that point so 
A 2-0 doesn't fully do uh, this series justice because that game two was absolutely nutty and incredibly back and forth throughout before it ends up going to 50 minutes. If you can even get a smile out of Humanoid after a game, then you know that you had a pretty spicy one um, on the Rift. So impressive uh, out of Fnatic. A bit of a level up, definitely, especially when you're talking about that bottom lane. But the rookies, Mirwin in particular, showing that he's got the spice. And these are guys not to be sleeping on, even in that loser's bracket. The biggest surprise series was probably SK versus Vitality. And this wasn't, it's not like SK were going to be massive favorites coming into this. But phew, this was full in control basically from start to finish out of vitality and the eu chovi memes are full steam ahead for bateo after this series number one yone one of the most iconic picks for chovi and number two the play style is fully there this guy was getting every single minion that he possibly could he was like 40 cs ahead of anyone else on his team mainly because he's probably stealing creeps across the map but Dominating side lanes and racking up ludicrous amounts of CS. That is the Chovy special 101 out of him. But really, um, the highlight was, again, much like Fnatic, the bot lane leveling up for Vitality. Karzi and Hillisang on an Ash pick. Didn't see that uh, aggressiveness out of him being able to pop off. But Leona, something we haven't seen in a long time. Obviously pairs very well with the Kalista. Karzi and Hilly had a fantastic series, especially when you think that on paper, you would have been given the edge to X-Kick and DOS in that straight up head-to-head -head 2v2 matchup. But um, Vitality, really across the board, uh, this Lee Sin mid in game two, that ended up going up against the Lucian. Originally wanted it, I'm sure, to counter uh, the Akali, but ends up going up against the Lucian, somehow survives. Didn't see any crazy kicks coming out of uh, Viteo, but wasn't really necessary because Daglas as a rookie found his footing. And as I mentioned, that bot lane steps up. So big kudos to Vitality. We've seen such ebbs and flows out of them going 0-3 and then 3-0 from back-to-back -back weeks. But definitely the 3-0 flipped heads uh, in that matchup against SK for Vitality. The other two series uh, kind of went more so, as you would expect, and uh, especially uh, the Team Heretics versus Team BDS. Especially when you're matching up against what Fateo did uh, against SK, and then you see perks, you see an Ezreal mid out of him, it just, it wasn't there. I mean, there was a big mid gap, Nuke definitely outperformed him, but for a squad with such veterans, perks, Yankos and Wonder. You remember when Perks initially left G2? That 2021 roster, you felt like the shot calling, the leadership, the communication wasn't there as Perks left. And Yankos stepped into that role. So now Yankos and Perks, you'd think the communication and game sense and knowledge with these veterans would be so on point. Even if individually maybe the mechanics aren't quite there, it wasn't. It's not. They seem lost. They're, face, they're forcing these team fights that are in choke points against these rumble poke comps for BDS and just not finding the right angles, forcing into flanks that they got no business being forced into. Although that flank actually looked like it was going to work until Nuke came in and absolutely piled past everyone. But a 2-0 two, two for BDS, pretty much as expected in that matchup. Team Heretics, I really don't have a lot of faith in them uh, in the loser's bracket. And depending on how that final series goes, even if it's a competitive loss, I mean, you're probably just running it back with this roster again. But this is case in point. I know we've seen all the rumors that Peter Dunn, you know, guys like Wonder and Yanko said, let's get perks. Let's get the reunion for the boys. G2's back. But you had Viteo on the roster. It feels like that's when the coaching staff and org has got to say, I know that that's your buddy, but we, Viteo's going to be better. It's going to fit our squad better. I feel like if if it was Viteo over Perks on Heretics right now, you'd be feeling a whole lot better, and they'd be legit contenders going forward, especially the level Viteo's looking at right now. But he's fit in seamlessly on uh, Vitality. The last matchup was uh, we were really cooking something up for G2 versus Giant X and this was won and lost in pick ban you feel like in both of these games um <laughs> the way mid for caps oh he was having fun and anytime cap caps is laughing on the rift you know it's it's a win 
before G2, but just doing absolutely ludicrous amounts of damage from a few screens across. We still haven't really seen the full power and damage potential of Way Unleashed. We've seen him support a couple of times, but look at that 100 to zero and poor Ignar. Why is this dude on Yumi? Mark and I are always talking. If it's an engaged meta, that's great. Ignar's here to pop off, but he's on Yumi in back to back games. They decided we should run that back again. Uh, the Zach Top in game two was an absolute menace for Broken Blade. The best other than Zeus that we have seen so far. I'm going to say he was absolutely on point picking up a lot of these passives. Odawamne could never deal with this Zach. It's more the full tank Zach's damage, which is uh, the bigger issue. But G2 completely, I mean, this is like 13 minutes. What is this? Almost a 6k gold lead. This was an absolute massacre. So we're getting the old El Clasico rivalry. Fnatic versus G2 in the next round. But... Even though Fnatic had a bit of a level up against Mad Lions Koi, they're going to need about two more tiers of leveling up if they want a chance against this version of G2, uh, especially just the draft diversity that they're able to do when you have both Broken Blade and Caps being able to play almost anything. And then you throw in uh, the idea that you can just be playing Senna, spamming Senna nonstop these days, and then Mickey is free to play whatever Orn, Maokai, engaged champion that he wants. So G2 remains absolutely that team to beat. Team BDS had a dominant one as well. So two O's across the board. Vitality upsetting. I'm putting air quotes over that one. SK was the biggest surprise, but this is only the beginning. We got the winners going right away on the Monday later today. And then we'll have the losers in the next rounds getting going next weekend in LEC action. Over to the LPL where the forgotten about defending champions JDG. The boys still got it. And finally, what was a marquee LPL matchup. JDG versus LNG who have looked pretty good. Uh, in their last series and after the fraud allegations after their first uh, series loss. But this is what's amazing so far about JDG is Flandre has not missed a beat. This guy didn't play for a full year and he's immediately getting put on some carry raid boss type champions like Aatrox and is leading JDG forward. The other new guy who's actually an old guy, Yagao in his return, had some, he got gapped in the first game of this series by Scout uh, and it was on Azir and Scout again gets the Azir in the third game but it is the Talia who's making the final impact. Yagao, some of the best ulties uh, this last one in particular, some of the best ultis that we've seen out of Atalia so far this year. I know we haven't seen that pick too, too often, but completely zoning out so much of LNG in the last two team fights, um, really. So Yagao bouncing back from the disaster Azir performance that they had in the first week and Ruler and Missing still looking as confident as ever. Kanabi is in mid-season form already. Despite missing two of their biggest players from last year, JDG still got a perfect start, 3-0 to the year, and obviously there's still plenty of room to level up to get close to that level that they were at as the Golden Road era last year, but getting a statement win against LNG in what was a competitive series, went three games, and that third game had its back and forth moments. LNG had a decent gold lead at one point and showing that they are still legit threats in the LPL but JDG still the team to beat of course we got to get eventually that marquee matchup against BLG to see if the JDG organization is still living rent free in the heads of BLG because both of those squads still remaining undefeated but JDG still menaces on the rift and now RNG is learning the Jauhu is also a menace on the rift. New top side for the Weibo Gaming Boys. Zhao Hao and ZDZ on the squad, and they have fit in pretty seamlessly. Light has low key been maybe the best or one of the best 80 carries so far in the LPL split, uh, but 
Jahu going up against his former squad, RNG, 2-1, both of these squads. RNG had a 9K gold lead in the first game, and this is... After game one, the spirits were broken for RNG. They were up 9k. They grab a Baron, but end up eventually forfeiting a bunch of kills. And Weibo, despite being down for the majority of the game, they just found the right angles to get in. And Xiaohu's LeBlanc was absolutely lethal on a lot of these flanks, finding the poke, finding the damage uh, to catch them out. But anytime you're down almost 10k, you know it's going to be a long road to a comeback. Even though they killed so many after that Baron, Weibo still had to find these nice flanks afterwards where, uh, you know, basically the whole squad of RNG is trying to push up front, but it was always Xiaohu poking, just being an absolute nuisance, which is the way to be for LeBlanc. But the real uh, highlight from this game was him stealing the Nexus against his former squad. And you know RG is, or RNG as an organization in the post Xiaohu era has not nearly been to the same level. And it, you know, he eventually gets like half health on this Nexus hit, but he tried multiple times. First, he took down the Nexus turrets, and then he left the base. Then he was trying to sneak back in, and then the final base. You know how it is in solo queue. When you see an exposed Nexus, it just, there's something that's triggered in your brain that says, I don't care how this game closes out. It's going to be me trying to backdoor to do it. And he does end up getting it done. The Weibo boys carried that momentum to 2-0 RNG and uh, move up to 3-1 and one towards the tippity top of that LPL table. But Weibo, I think we're forgetting. We're sleeping on this squad that they were fresh off a world finals run. And I know the shy leaving the squad, everyone's feeling low about them, but... Xiaohao might even be looking like an upgrade with an actual solid laning team around him. And ZDZ, he's not going to have the highs that the Shy has. Almost no player in the world will, but he's not going to reach that bottom seller level that we also saw the Shy hit multiple times across the 2023 season. So Weibo still absolutely a contender heading into this LPL season. That is all the time today, though. For League Unlock. My name is Eric. You people stay absolutely beautiful as always. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll catch you on that flippity flip.